Uh, in a moment or two, Dean Markham will uh, introduce uh, and welcome you and our distinguished uh, panel. Uh, I would also like to uh, welcome our panel. It's been a joy to get to know them uh, over these past couple of uh, days. I'd also like to welcome those of you who are joining us uh, on our live link and those of you who are joining us in more conventional ways. You're all very welcome to this very important event this evening. My name is uh, Robert Heaney. I'm the director for the Centre uh, for Anglican Communion Studies. At the heart of the Centre for Anglican Communion Studies and a Christian understanding of participation in the mission of God lies a three-fold vision summed up in three imperatives. Reflect, resource, reconcile. The Centre provides space for theological reflection through international gatherings, international partners and international uh, students. To resource, the Centre produces research, publications and consultations that address the various challenges facing Anglicans and their neighbours throughout the world today. To reconcile, we begin with the awareness of the plural and pluralist context that Episcopalians and Anglicans live in today. Given that these contexts provoke tension and conflict, as well as faith and hope, we in the Centre for Anglican Communion Studies are committed to conversation, dialogue and partnership with those who witness to the love and peace of God. I hope you will witness how an evening reflecting on Islam in the modern world can resource our thinking and practice and ultimately lead to transformative and reconciling acts. The vision of reconciliation and mutual engagement was strongly advocated by the Muslim theologian Said Nursi. He lived from 1876 to 1960 in the Ottoman Empire. He witnessed the painful eras of World War I, World War II, the rise of modernity and the challenges that posed to all people of faith and all faith communities. We are delighted therefore to be in relationship with the Istanbul Foundation for Science and Culture. The institution was founded when I was but a child in 1979 <laughs> and exists for the dissemination of the thought of Nursi. For CACs and for VTS, the Istanbul Foundation is an important conversation partner. For to be in dialogue with Muslim voices like Nursi who are deeply rooted in their faith tradition and committed to the common good is at the heart of the center's vision and practice. It is at the heart of what makes human flourishing and what in turn, declares the glory of God. <coughs> You're all welcome. Thank you. It really is an honor to uh, have such a distinguished group of panelists to address tonight's topic, which is Islam in the modern world, Saeed Norsi's perspective. Uh, I'm uh, very interested in the work of Ben Dusum and Saeed Norsi, um, and that might strike some people as a little strange. I am first and foremost a Christian by virtue of my baptism. Uh, I am uh, a, uh, I'm also a husband to my wife Leslie, who's with us tonight, and my son Luke, who's on a flight to Greece. Uh, uh, but I am also the Dean and President of Virginia Theological Seminary and an Episcopal priest. So there's an obvious question, why should a Dean of a Christian seminary be so interested in this major Islamic thinker? Now, some people get involved in interfaith because they're not sure about their faith. They're sort of skeptical. And therefore, they come to these questions and say, you know, it just is, uh, given I'm not sure about my faith, I'm very eager to learn about other traditions, and, and that's a, an approach which makes some sense. Some people get involved in interfaith and become skeptical about their faith. So there are different ways you get to this destination. So you know where I come from. I come out of uh, my tradition. I am 
uh, a person who follows the Lord Jesus, loves the Lord Jesus, and seeks to honor the disclosure of God in Christ, the eternal word made flesh. And therefore, I'm involved in interfaith out of fidelity to my tradition. Uh, because after all, our Lord commanded us to love our neighbor as ourselves. And how would I like to be treated? Well, first and foremost, I would like to be understood. I would like to be respected. I would like people to understand my worldview. So that is a primary reason why we ought to be involved in interreligious dialogue and get to know our Muslim neighbor. But there's more. The Christian tradition has actually always been involved in interfaith. I mean, Augustine of Hippo, the great father of the church, his conversation partner was Platonism. He read Plotinus, and he took it all seriously and learnt from it, and it shaped his theology. And Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century, the Dominican friar, perhaps the premier Roman Catholic theologian with a continuing influence on that tradition, he was the gentleman who actually learned uh, of Aristotle through Muslims and constructed a conversation between his Augustinian Platonism and the Aristotelian tradition. And interestingly, in the Summa Theologica, he constantly cites both Christian, Muslim, and Islamic thinkers, and Jewish thinkers. Christian, Muslim, and Islamic, it sounds a little tautological. So <laughs> Christian, Jewish, and Muslim thinkers. And then finally, so therefore I, I embark on the conversation because I can learn uh, from the wisdom of another tradition. And it can shape my theology and my understanding of how God relates to us. And I do so because we live in a fragile world where human brokenness is destructive. And there are so many groups which are determined to be antagonistic and cruel. And yet Christ commands all Christians to be peacemakers and to be agents of peace. And therefore, it's important for us to witness the constructive relationships with our neighbors. So I've spent now almost a decade. Robert Heaney was probably still a child. <laughs> <laughs> at least he was at university by then. Um, uh, reflecting on the work of the Rasali and Noor, uh, Ben Jusum and Said Norsi's primary uh, corpus. And I've learned a great deal. I've learned about the importance of being rooted in your tradition and being faithful to it. I, I've learned from his spirituality and his powerful critique of nature and the world uh, as a disclosure of the revelation of God, the book of the universe. And I've grown to admire the way in which, in his situation, he foresees in the early part of the 20th century that the primary challenge facing people of faith will be secular atheism. And he anticipates that, and he invites Christians and Muslims to work together in response to this shared challenge for the sake of our children. And therefore, I have received an enormous gift, a gift I'm very, very grateful for. So tonight, you will be hearing from distinguished colleagues uh, who have spent their life uh, working on Ben Yusuma Said Norsi. And it's my great privilege and pleasure to start by introducing uh, the director of the Istanbul Foundation for Science and Culture, Dr. Faris Kaya. Please give him a warm welcome. Good evening, everybody, ladies and gentlemen, and sisters and brothers, because we are in America. <laughs> and uh, I would like to express my deep thanks to Professor Ian Markham and his colleagues, his friends, and some of you I met earlier. We have hosted some of you, like Professor Jones in Istanbul and others. And uh, it is really a real privilege for me to be with you, among you. And I feel myself at home among yours. Now, uh, I think we have very little time, isn't it? About five minutes. So uh, let me begin with the joke. <laughs> Since I have less time, perhaps this will encourage 
Dr. Markham to increase my time a bit. <laughs> Two shepherds were, you, you see, in the countryside. One of them asked the other, what would you like to eat? He said, the, the, the you know, central part of uh, onion. And then that one asked the other one, what would you like to eat? There is nothing remained. <laughs> so <laughs> after Dr. Robert and Dr. Markham, we have nothing to say. <laughs> Anyway, uh, just let me you know five minutes, okay? Uh, uh, I hope that I, I can you know, present what I want to say. Just before coming here, one night before coming here, we had, oh, Taliba, welcome. We had a group of uh, Malaysian students visited our foundation, which received almost every day, you know, several different groups coming from all over the world because Nursi's views and idea that they find something them, for themselves. And a lady asked, what was the latest lesson that Nursi gave to his disciples, students? And I opened the, uh, that part of, from the Risa Lenur, which I think about less than one year ago before his death. He gave this lecture to his students. Now imagine a person like Nursi delivering his last will. What would you expect him to say to his students? Now first thing, he said that act positively, positive action, he calls. I don't know if in English it makes it any sense. Positively. Yeah, positively. He said that never criticize others first. And secondly, never involve in physical confrontation with others. Always try to put forward what you think is good for yourself and for the others. And the second point that he, he tried to make is that he drew their attention to be away from worldliness, materialism. As there is a hadith of Prophet, a saying of Prophet Muhammad, the, the, the head of all wrong things is the love of worldliness. So Nursi also advised his students to be away, to be careful, not to be caught by the trap of materialism and worldliness. And the third point that he emphasized on being careful of hopelessness. He said that the most dangerous disease of our time is hopelessness. Now, when people become hopeless, they go, you know, they, they commit suicide, they get using of drugs, or they, 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 they become, you know, uh, frustrated because of, the, you know, things that he thinks that he cannot do that, and then then he starts you know, doing violence and uh, committing terrorist acts, etc. And the fourth point, he said that be sincere in your action, in your these previous three actions. Sincerity, as you know, is the cleanliness of the intention, what you are doing. So be and do everything for the sake of God, not anything else. I hope that these four points can make any sense for all of us. Thank you very much for being here and then accepting us among you. Thank you.
And I'm very impressed. That was five minutes, 23 seconds, 92. What, what's the breakdown of seconds? Milliseconds, milliseconds, thank you. 92 milliseconds. This is the joy of technology. That's right, and that's inclusive of the joke. So that's very impressive. Uh, one of the great delights of this uh, conference is to uh, meet people who previously studied at Hartford Seminary. And although Isra was, uh, uh, was finishing just as I arrived, she was shaped by that uh, institution where I served for a time as the academic dean. Uh, she has published a book entitled Understanding the Quranic Miracle Stories in the Modern Age, which is an important text. So please give Dr. Isra Yazid you're the only... <laughs> no, I got it wrong. Uh, warm welcome. Thank you very much. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate. I'm delighted to be here, uh, and thank you for this beautiful welcome. I'm very grateful to um, Dr. Markham and, uh, and the seminary for hosting us. Um, so uh, talking about Islam in modern age and Said Nursi's perspective on it, um, I, could, I was thinking what, it, what I could talk about. There's so much. Uh, one key word came, came to me, and that's um, a term that Nursi uses in his text. Um, he talks about Islam uh, being al-insani um, al-kubra, uh, which is this uh, flourished humanity, comprehensive humanity, to be um, a Muslim, uh, which literally means the one who surrenders to God, is to reach this highest level of being fully human. So I think um, one key aspect of Said Nursi's perspective um, on Islam in the modern age is to really fruitfully engage with the question of how to be fully human in the modern age. And uh, we are in this incredible age of uh, uh, modernity. Uh, and uh, at the same time, there's so many uh, things that are eternally, perennially with human beings. So we are still human, even, when we, even though with this oldest technology and longer life that we live, uh, we are still fully human in the sense that we are um, all um, asking the questions of uh, uh, about transience that we it's incredible that on the one hand we can do so much on the other hand we're all finite and we're passing uh, and this gathering is wonderful and after a couple hours we'll we'll have dispersed and the whole life is a series of dispersions unions and dispersions and then death is is always always there um, so that that question of being finite and how do we um, make sense of that. And at the same time, as human beings, we have this incredible tension dilemma, a very fruitful dilemma uh, of, on the one hand, we have all these yearnings and desires and potentials. On the other hand, we're so vulnerable and finite. I mean, we, we have no control over so many things in our personal lives. And also, in general, in the planet, we, we don't control so many things. Um, and so what, what do we do with this tension? On the one hand, we have these incredible yearnings. On the other hand, we have so little potential, to, uh, and Nursi really fully engages with, with these um, in the light of revelation, in the life to, light of divine guidance, uh, in, this, in his case, Quran, but he's very open uh, to the idea that um, to affirm Quran means to affirm all the other divine speeches. It is not the only speech of God. And, and also, what is insightful with Nursi, the second part, is that he recognizes the uh, modern uh, complications and challenges of being human. Uh, one thing that's, um, that's an important aspect in the modern age is that um, many people falsely think that because we have progressed so much in science and technology, we have less need to connect with transcendent. And that's just nonsense, uh, which Nursi very, very, um, very, um, Nice deconstructs. He doesn't take it for granted, or nor does he rejects the questions. He really welcomes questions, asks questions, engages, and really is very helpful in seeing that actually uh, these developments in science, at best, they're they're calling us more into uh, finding the one behind this incredible order rather than turning away from it. And another challenge in the modern age is um, when we as human beings we resist feeling vulnerable and we. 
we want to play God as much as we can, at least a part of us does. And this has always been the case. There's nothing modern about it. At the same time, in the modern age, we have this incredible capacity to numb ourselves, that uh, we have already, we have so many different um, addictions and gadgets and things that can numb our um, yearning for infinity and these searches, our qu questions. And that's, that's the, um, that's a challenge the nurse really works through, and he really tries to entice uh, the reader to, to really embrace the, this internal search uh, for God and really engage with the world we live in. Uh, and and um, this world is filled with invitations to uh, the, the source of um, beauty and power, uh, the transcendent, and, and it is not a burden, but it's a joy to connect with transcendent, and I think um, these are two major ways in which Nursi really um, invites us um, to um, a deeper vision of Islam. Uh, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Dr. Yaziji Olu. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Colin Turner. Dr. Colin Turner is a Muslim uh, from England. He has probably written the definitive exegetical text on the Rasali Noor. Um, and uh, it's a remarkable uh, study which has recently come out entitled The Quran Revealed a Critical Analysis of Saeed Norsi's Epistles of Light. Please welcome Dr. Colin Turner. I think as we go on, there is less and less to say because you're, you're saying it. Um, unlike Professor Kaya, I don't have any jokes. Um, I could start some karaoke and get things going. Um, really, um, what Esther was saying, actually, um, I should be echoing um, in my own way. Um, for me, as a Muslim, when I first encountered Said Nursi as an undergraduate, I'd been a Muslim for about four or five years, um, I was quite shocked. Said Nursi's Islam was very different to the interpretations and readings and understandings that I was used to. He actually talked about God. Um, and I realized as I started to engage with Nursi and to read him that um, you've heard about postmodern man has a God-shaped hole in the center. I actually realized after I started reading Nursi that at that time Muslim thought had a God-shaped hole at the center. And Nursi was bringing back the God that had been displaced. Nursi's theology, Nursi's discourse, Nursi's teachings are both God-centric and man-centric, anthropocentric and theocentric. Nursi addresses those existential dilemmas that we all have. Where did I come from? What am I doing here? Where will I go? What's my duty while I'm here? These are questions that we all ask. And we come into this world. The world for Nursi is like a book. And the book is full of signs. And those signs are telling us something. And one of Nursi's great, um, one of the great features about Nursi is he says, read creation like a book. Because the book is telling you something. The book is not pointing to itself. It's pointing to something beyond itself. <coughs> And of course, creation is pointed to the creator. So Nursi, for me, brought back God into the center of things. He brought back the notion that we are here for duties, for a certain purpose. And our longing for eternity and our longing for the infinite, as Isra was saying, shows that there must be an eternity. There must be an infinite. We are finite beings with infinite longings. How do we fulfill them? So all of these questions are the questions, these, these very sharp and often painful existential questions and dilemmas that we ask ourselves. And Nursi, for me, answers those. Or he directs us to particular ways and means of answering those questions. That was the appeal of Nursi for me. And I don't know whether I've exhausted my five minutes yet. You're up to three. I'm up to three. I'm up to three. <laughs> so Nursi. Um, I often say that Nursi, in a sense, rescued me. 
He saved me. And I'm not talking about sort of eschatological salvation. He saved me from what I call pseudo-Islam. He saved me from interpretations of Islam which I often don't recognize as actually having any kind of relevance to the religion that I originally accepted. When I say pseudo-Islam, um, like Islam itself, it's not monolithic. There are lots of different flavors, lots of different types, lots, lots of different forms. There are forms which emphasize politics. There are forms, for example, which um, stress that we have to go back to the caliphate. We have to reinstate the caliphate. There are readings of Islam which put a lot of emphasis on the Sharia, a word that you, I'm sure you've all heard. Reinstate the Sharia, create an Islamic republic, create an Islamic state. Could I just have some water? Norsi doesn't talk about these things. Norsi doesn't seem to be particularly interested in politics. He was famously apolitical. He withdrew from politics. He's not really um, that involved in any kind of campaign to bring back the caliphate, or to reinstate the Sharia, or to implement the penal codes of Islam. These are actually not discussed by Norsi. And if he talks about the externals of religion, it is only incidentally, it's only in person. The central core of Nursi's teaching is basically how do we forge a relationship with God? How do we understand our place in the cosmic scheme? What are we? Why are we here? What does submission mean? What does worship mean? And it's questions of faith, basically, which take up, I would say, the lion's share of Nursi's magnum opus, which is the Risale Nur, 6,000 pages. Very, very little is given over to any kind of discussion of social political issues at all. And during the so called Islamic revival of the past 30 years, his voice is really a lone voice. His voice is an authentic voice, which is drawing on centuries and centuries of uh, Muslim scholarly tradition. His voice is a voice which is not heard very often. Um, I'm not saying it's a quiet voice, but it's a voice which is stifled, which is drowned out by more vocal um, understandings and interpretations of, of Islam. And I think one of the things which may be, um, in a sense, uh, the saving grace of the Muslim world is if the Muslim world is actually able to rediscover authenticity, to rediscover authentic scholarship, and to rediscover those ideals and realities of, of belief which seem to have been trampled underfoot by political Islam, by understandings and interpretations of Islam which are politically ideologized. So Nursi presents a very, very different vision. But actually, when you start to engage with that vision, you realize that this is basically a continuation of authentic Islamic understanding of creation. Am I done? <laughs> OK, thank you. Do you know, there is something amazing, isn't there? You know, um, that, that was a very succinct portrait. And incidentally, I admire so much the way that our speakers are keeping to their time. But, you know, so you have this, this vision of a, um, a theologically, uh, a theologically focused thinker who's inviting us, in the words of Isra, to uh, focus on the questions that preoccupy us in the modern world uh, in a way that's not fixated on politics, nor is it preoccupied with violence, but it's, a, it's an invitation, as uh, Faris put it, uh, to a deeper spirituality. Um, and that's one of the reasons why this is a remarkable gift, not simply to Muslims, but also to interlocutors such as Christians. Uh, Sully Sullivan uh, is, um, the, I think, the only student at Virginia Theological Seminary, who served for a year uh, on this campus. Uh, he's now a doctoral student in the Religion and Culture Program at the Catholic University of America. And he's also adjunct faculty and chaplain in residence at Georgetown University. Come on up, Sally. Thank you, dear Markham. Good evening. Peace be with you. Assalamu alaikum. 
Um, so I think most of the things that I would say uh, would over, overlap with uh, what has been said. But I just would like to share my personal story with Nursi's writings. Um, I was grown up in a small town in the eastern part of Turkey and went to Istanbul to study you know, in the college. And I exposed uh, to Nursi's writing when, uh, during my years at the college. And of course, from a small town to, to Istanbul, um, it was a, a major shift for me in terms of uh, being exposed to modernity, being exposed to uh, secularism. Uh, so it was really a challenging situation for me. And to some extent, I had uh, a spiritual crisis. And it, in this sense, um, and of course, when we say, um, and this is, I mean, Dean Markham convinced me that I am one of the millennials. Uh, <laughs> and this is, uh, when it comes to you know, our relation with uh, uh, secularism, modernity, uh, with regard to our challenges um, uh, of uh, our spirituality, I would say that the, the story that we have in Turkey, um, we have in America, we have in Canada, we have in Europe, because I, I mean, I spent time in Estonia, in Canada. So the, the, the story is the same. The challenges that, is, that come with modernity and excessive uh, secularism. And the tendency, actually, again, in, uh, uh, you know, with the Enlightenment, there has been the tendency that, um, uh, so now uh, let's remove God from the picture, right? A life without God and uh, with science and materialism, uh, we will accomplish everything. So then we will meet all, all the needs of human beings through secularism, through science and modernity. Uh, and of course, it did not uh, help uh, millennials. And I am one of them. And in this sense, Nursi's writing has been a, a life-saving boat for me. Uh, just to, and the, to, be, to be a confident believer today is a challenging thing. You know, if you go to a secular campus, I live on Georgetown campus, and you sometimes, you know, many times you see students in the class who, who, who are, you know, you see they're very spiritual, they, uh, they are believers, but they feel shy. They, they don't want to talk if they have a point. Because, well, the reason is because uh, the other voice is so dominant uh, and uh, when you are a believer, this is something that uh, you don't have confidence. And in this end, Nursi made me a confident believer. You know, you can be, and again, in, during my time in Istanbul, there was a tendency, if, if you are a believer, you cannot be a successful medical doctor. You cannot be a successful engineer. You cannot be a successful professor. They are not compatible with each other. And actually, Nursi first showed us Yes, you can be a successful uh, doctor, you can be a successful professor, but also a, a strong believer, a believer who takes God seriously and have a God-centered life. Uh, so this has been my experience uh, with Nursi's writing. Thank you for your attention. I, I think that's so important for us to hear that the challenge of skepticism is not just confined to coastal America, uh, but it is a challenge elsewhere in the world. And therefore, finding resources that explain faith in a way that's credible and persuasive is really important. And Sali very eloquently explained how the Rasali Noor played that role in his life. It really is a great privilege for me to introduce the final panelist. Uh, uh, we're very proud at Virginia Theological Seminary to have our loose Muslim visiting scholar. This is building on work that um, Dr. Rich Jones, the Reverend Dr. Rich Jones, who's down here in the front, um, served for many years in uh, pioneering in this institution a commitment to uh, interreligious dialogue and the importance of that conversation. And he was delighted when we were able to find the resources through the generosity of the Luce Foundation to appoint a Luce Muslim visiting scholar. 
Uh, Zainab has stepped into that role extremely well. She is ABD. In fact, do ask her every single time you see her how the dissertation's coming along. Um, she's at that stage where she needs daily reminders uh, to bring it to completion. Um, and we will celebrate with her when that day arrives. Um, so she's finishing a doctorate at Georgetown, and she is also a chaplain residence at Georgetown University. Zainab, please come on up. Thank you, Dean Markham. Um, I greet you all with the blessings of peace. Assalamu alaikum. Um, it's been really a privilege to teach here at Virginia Theological Seminary. I can't um, uh, thank Dean Markham enough for giving me that opportunity. And um, I see um, my wonderful students in the audience. Uh, so it's been a great um, experience so far. I would like to just um, follow the lines of my better half, my husband, and uh, just share how I came to the Risale Nur. And I think it's important to share our personal stories because I think we are just um, a testament to, um, to Nursi's accomplishment. Uh, I grew up uh, in Germany as a child of Kurdish Muslim immigrants who came from Turkey. Uh, and I grew up in a very pluralist society uh, as a Muslim, uh, in a non-Muslim society, very secular. Uh, belief was not something you necessarily, even as a Christian, uh, you don't uh, put it uh, much out there. Um, so prayer was often uh, an issue. I mean, uh, many uh, of you know that Muslims tend to pray five times a day. So to sneak out, we just had a wonderful conference here uh, the past weekend in um, the Anglican Woman uh, at Prayer Conference where we actually talked about prayer and shared our faith experiences, which was wonderful. But one of the challenges you face in the modern world is really um, to appreciate the sacredness. I mean, basically to maintain uh, and declare the sacredness of life and uh, the sacredness of the universe. And Nursi was just wonderful in that sense because uh, when you're reading about his notion of prayer, how he interprets um, or what he offers as his reading uh, of the five times prayer, the canonical prayer of Muslims. It's just beautiful because he uh, makes the believer understand that it's not simply an individual act, but it's a cosmic act. In a sense, when um, a believer prays five times a day, uh, this is basically a declaration of, um, of the divine uh, and also uh, in, uh, basically an expression of that cosmic brotherhood we have with the creation. That the trees, he says, when you are in the standing position, um, basically you remind yourself as the steward on earth of, of God's vice regent, viceroy, that you are not just an entity to yourself, but you are connected to um, the creation, to the trees and mountains who are constantly in the standing position. And then when you go, into the bowing position, you are reflecting the animals and the creatures, the creation of God. And, uh, and then finally, in the prostration, in the act of prostration, you are representing as a cosmic, as a microcosm, as Isra so nicely formulated, you are basically a little uh, example of the universe. And so trees, mountains, animals, stones, insects crawling on the ground, you are connected to the universe. And in that sense, there exists a divine, uh, a sacred bond with the universe, the creation, everything what exists, the planets, the stars. This is something the Quran refers to, that everything in the creation is engaged in prayer, in devotion, glorifying God, exalting God. So that was deeply profound for me because we live in a world as believers where we have a desacralization of the universe where we have a, a total disconnect of that sacredness, where we feel that our entity is just our living existence is just reduced to our existence and that we can exploit nature and that we can take the resources. But when reading Nursi, I realized as a believer 
in that modern context, wait a minute, there is no dichotomy of sacred and profane, something which came up with the rise of modernity, that dualism basically. Oh, this is a sacred act, this is a worldly act or a profane act. There's no such thing because while reading the Risalit, his, uh, his work, we realize that everything is sacred. And you just basically, through that act of prayer, maintaining that sacredness, declaring it uh, sacred. And I think this is something which we as believers face. As, 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 this is a common challenge, that de, um, desacralization, basically, that God is taken totally out of the center, especially when we talk about the environment. And that we feel that we can just use the resources uh, as much as we can. And, and, and that dichotomy of the sacred uh, and uh, the profane, this is a deeply problematic. And I think by reading, engaging with the thought of Nursi, he basically gives you that sacred outlook on life. When you look at people, you don't see people. You see the divine qualities reflected in every human being. And that transcends categories of nationalism, ethnic identities, racial identities, Jewish, Buddhist, Muslim. When I look at a person now, I see God reflected. I don't see labels or, or these constructed uh, social uh, categories. And I think that helped me as a believer living in a pluralist society to really go beyond these kind of Christian, Muslim, Jewish, Buddhist, atheist, uh, kind of uh, categories which are still important, but they are not primary, and that really helps um, help me as a young Muslim to engage into, uh, and uh, which made me actually commit to interfaith conversations. Because if I truly have the conviction that everything is sacred, I have to embrace it. I have to engage with it. I have to step into a conversation with it, uh, with everything. And uh, what is happening right now in the universe, what we see witness is the exploitation of the universe or the crisis, the environmental crisis we have now in the modern world is basically a reflection of our inner spiritual crisis because the disconnect of uh, the disintegration of the human being has led to the fragmentation of the universe. And I think this is a challenge. We are one human family. Uh, this is our planet, and if we, um, as Liz says, don't get our act together, we will all sink. Well, hopefully that will not be the case, but um, I'm very hopeful. But I think this is our common challenge, and sometimes we forget about that. And uh, that it's Nursi's worldview of looking always, he says, there are two ways of looking at the things, at the events or the universe. It's either other indicative, as Colin nicely formulated, other indicative, manai harfi, uh, or manai ismi, that you have a self-referential look, that you look at, a, at someone or at, at something and say, oh, it is beautiful, or do you say it was beautifully made? So everything in the creation reminds you of your creator, and that should be sufficient for you to be inclusive, to engage in dialogue. So thank you very much. I mean, it is astonishing, really, isn't it? You know, this extraordinary portrait of, of a substantial, uh, which has uh, uh, millions of followers around the globe, and yet so few people have heard of this thinker. And just to summarize the portrait you've heard, I mean, Said Norsi, as Robert Heaney explained, is contextually Turkish, emerging from the Ottoman Empire, going through World War I, having to cope with the secular uh, society that then emerged. Uh, a formidable thinker, prolific writer, uh, who is faithful. I mean, so don't characterize him as a liberal Muslim. I mean, he's completely committed to the core of the faith, uh, to the infallibility of the Quran, to the significance of the prophet, deeply observant, and at the same time, and because of these things, committed to nonviolence, focused on spirituality and prayer, and as Zainab put it so eloquently, seeing God in the other. Deeply di dialogical and a project that confronts the challenges of the age in which we live, uh, the inner spiritual crisis of our time. Now, uh, we're hoping that those watching on the live stream will feel free to join us by Twitter. We thought Mr. Erdogan was going to make it a tad tricky by making 
Twitter illegal in Turkey, but I'm pleased to see that there is there are friends in Istanbul who've reassured us that they are tweeting, so perhaps we shouldn't draw attention to it just in case <laughs> they all get in trouble. Um, so this is your opportunity to join the conversation. Uh, we have a strict rule, uh, and that is that uh, you've got to wait for a mic to come to you. And to illustrate what that involves, I'm going to ask the mic to come to uh, Dr. Lucinda Mosher. Now, Lucinda um, is uh, one of uh, the Episcopal Church's uh, leading uh, thinkers on, on issues around interfaith has published a, a recent volume which looks at the Episcopal Church and interfaith, and I'm going to invite her to make a few remarks. And what she does is a model for everybody else who says, does anything. So, Lucinda, please. Well, thank you, Ian. It is on. Okay, thank you, Ian. At the outset of our roundtable, which began yesterday morning, Ian expressed his preference for authenticity meeting authenticity. And I hope you discerned that tonight on this panel. I, too, came to uh, interfaith relations as uh, I, I continue to come to interfaith relations work that, that in that arena, as Ian does, because I'm convinced that it is an act of faithfulness. And I came to Nursi's thought uh, it, and at the beginning of my work on my dissertation at General Seminary. So I, too, wrestled with Nursi's legacy in a, a Christian institution, in an Episcopal institution. So it's great fun to be here doing this together. Uh, I hope you have discerned what an incredible treasure trove Nursi's legacy is, 6,000 pages. So my question to you panelists is, what would be your advice to the novice be? When one is first dipping one's toe into Nursi's written legacy, what might one read first? What I'm going to do with questions is I think I'm going to, on most occasions, just invite no more than two panelists to respond, because otherwise we will end up with um, only three questions being asked. <laughs> uh, let's start uh, with um, Colin, please. Uh, and Colin, when you speak, grab a mic and speak into it. Um, and then I think Parrish, you've lived with the text longest. So uh, what a way in to the Rosali Nor, where would you begin, Colin, please? It's very difficult to actually try to sort of give any kind of guidance on where to begin. Um, begin where you're most interested. Um, Said Nursi, is, his corpus of writings is something that you can dip into. It's not a book or a series of books that you read from A to Z, from beginning to end. So it's sort of thematically structured. Um, and it's made up of a number of treatises. And there are treatises, for example, on the human self, the ego. There are treatises on the hereafter. There are lots of examples of pastoral theology, um, where Nursi talks about advice to the sick, advice to those in prison, advice to young people, um, which, of course, uh, advice to the elderly, which is becoming increasingly relevant. Um, <laughs> And these are all basically um, writings which are born out of his own experience. So there is the pastoral theolo theological side. Um, there are treatises on brotherhood and sincerity. There are lots and lots of different things that you can dip into. And they are not sort of, they're, they're not part of a coherent whole. Now, I don't want to make him sound incoherent. Um, but it's not a page one to page 6,000 read. You can dip in and out. Um, so basically, it's whatever takes your fancy. Um, the treatise on nature was particularly appealing for me, and I think that's what we started with about 30 years ago, looking at the treatise of nature, um, where Nursi talks about causation, about cause and effect. Um, that was eye-opening, basically, and it's basically Nursi's um, response to scientism, the notion that science can actually solve everything. Um, but basically, the core of that particular treatise is that cause and effect are only apparent and that the true creator is God. God creates both cause and effect. Um, that, for me, was, was particularly fascinating. And so basically, start wherever you, you, you can or wherever you want to start. The only problem is, is um, the translations. Uh, Nursi writes in a very, um, I'm not going to say long-winded, but some of the sentences, he's writing in Ottoman Turkish. And some of the sentences can be a page long. 
Um, and the translation, uh, there, there is a very, very good translation of the Risale Nur. And um, unfortunately, or fortunately, it's very faithful to the original. Um, <laughs> And in its faithfulness to the original, you will also find very, very long and cumbersome sentences. So the best thing that I could advise anyone who wants to start reading the Vestalian Noor is to read with someone else. And collective reading anyway uh, is a blessing because you have the meeting of brains. And all of the brains in this room would solve a problem much more quickly than one person in this room. And that also, when we're reading the Vestalian Noor as well, we, we have the blessing of other people's understandings, other people's perspectives, other people's expertise, and that could be linguistic expertise, historical expertise, theological expertise. And we tend to do our readings in groups. Um, so anyone here who wants to start reading the Rissale, you have experts all around you. Um, pick a treatise, a short treatise, which you know the title may take your fancy. Sit down, jump in, and enjoy. OK, thank you, Colin. And Faris, please. Yeah. Now, uh, is it okay? Yeah. Now, let me, uh, I mean, uh, begin where Colin left, Dr. Colin left. Uh, now, if we just look at the entries of Risa Leynur collection, I think you have here in this, uh, in the library of seminary uh, in English, one set. And you will find that uh, some parts are on contemplation reflections of uh, the names and attributes of God in the universe. So if we want you know, to study, to know, easily to read, to see God everywhere, uh, we may read you know, these parts. For example, like you know, Supreme Sign. It is called the part about 60 to 70 pages. And it is as if you, know, you are eating Turkish baklava. <laughs> OK, now I'm delighted we've got a question on Twitter. Please, we encourage those uh, both inside and outside to tweet. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a cycle of three. I'm going to go Twitter, one, two. OK, that's going to be the elaborate system. Uh, so let's take the Twitter question next. What's the common message of Norsi for Muslims and Christians today? And I think uh, Zainab can perhaps answer that one. Um. What's the common message from? Uh, of Norsi for Muslims yeah, and Christians uh, mm -hmm. today. That's very wise. A good answering strategy, incidentally, is always to repeat the question. Always repeat it the question. It gives you a few process. moments to collect <laughs> your, your thoughts. Actually, you told me to say, you know, it's always good to say, that's a very interesting question. <laughs> he, he's my, he was my professor and still is at, at Hartford Seminary. So that's what I'm doing. That's a very interesting question. And as I just <laughs> said in my little speech, um, I think the most important message is really, uh, you, you know, that sacred outlook on life he really has. It's not an abstract idea he lives. Uh, it's really in his bones, uh, internalized, and he's just modeling how he is uh, maintaining that sacredness throughout his life. Uh, when he approaches the creation, human beings, uh, Christians, he, writing particularly, uh, approaching questions. But I think really, um, I've been engaged at Georgetown uh, as a Muslim chaplain, not just with Muslims, but also with uh, students of all faith backgrounds and no faith background. And what I always uh, witness is we have this little gathering where we, it's under the banner of Ignatian spirituality because it's Georgetown, it's, uh, it's a Jesuit university. So Ignatian spirituality is something we, we are talking, and there are people who have no, who, who, are, who are not really engaged in faith. But uh, in these 6,000 commentaries, what I always bring into these conversations is Nursi's understanding of human nature, of his inward reading of what, how are you going to embrace your vulnerability? What is the ego? Why do you have emotions? Uh, what, are, what, what are you going to do with feelings? And then he lays out different feelings, human feelings. So he really takes you into an inward journey, like this huge capacity he talks about is love. Love. Everyone loves. Christians, Muslims, Jews, Buddhists, atheists. So on that basis, uh, he talks about this, what Isra described as this infinite capacity to love. Uh, but at the same time, 
we as human beings, as finite human beings, we realize that the creation is finite. So he, he leads you into this inward reading, and through that inward reading teaches you, any human being, that there is no other choice than God to love because you have an infinite potential of love, but everything around you is finite and limited and created weak and imperfect, has flaws or will depart eventually or you will depart eventually. So what do you do with that love then? So you direct it to something, someone who is infinite and everlasting and ever living and the hereafter. And then everything really becomes an act of sacred love. So I think uh, human nature, his, his, um, a common message would be really to, to his inward reading, and that's the common denominator across all faith traditions, across all humanity, to really go back and understand who we are. I think most of the problems today in the modern world is really we, have, we are alienated from ourselves. We don't know who we are anymore. There's so much confusion, whether it's gender, what are we supposed to do as women, how are we going to, who are we? And he really comes in holistically and uh, takes you into this inward journey and makes sense of how to understand your human self. And I think that's his deepest message for me in that sense, where I can relate to other people of all faith or no faith is, who are we as human beings? What's our nature? And uh, how are we created? And how do we um, find our place in this complex world? And I found this really always very engaging wherever I go, and that's, I think, something we can learn from. Okay, this side of the room, please. Is there a question? There's one over there. So we'll do that side of the room first. <laughs> uh, Liz, Chris Lane, please. Hello. Th thank you for being here. Um, my question is, um, how consonant is the thought of Nursi with kind of the overall Islamic tradition? From, oh, from Muhammad. That, that's an excellent question. So how consistent is uh, the Noor movement with the overall Islamic tradition? Isra, please. Um, that's a great question. Um, I want to tell you um, a little anecdote that I, I shared already today. Um, and um, when I was a graduate student um, doing Islamic studies in Cambridge, I met um, a, Muslim, a Muslim scholar. Um, um, from Libya, an Arab Muslim scholar. And uh, he, um, I was asking him, what shall I read? You know, give me some sources that I should definitely not miss as someone in the Islamic studies field. And he, uh, I, I took a pen and he said, Look, you have to know some classical Islamic heritage. You cannot, you know, not know these. So I, I had my pen. He said, did you read this? I'm like, no. Uh, did you read this? Well, not that particular. Uh, and then I, 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 I had a long list. And finally, he said, "Did you read Said Nursi?" I said, "Yeah, yeah, I did. I mean, you know, not you know, expert, but I mean." Oh, he said, "That's then you're fine." He said, "If you," <laughs> he exact. I'm not. He said, "If you take all of these classical um, traditional Islamic scholars and put them in a blender, their works, I mean." <laughs> <laughs> and then if you just uh, visit, what will come out will be Nursi. So in that sense, uh, anybody who has some expertise in classical um, Islam, when he looks at Nursi, uh, he will see that it's, it's all there. And he's really, um, his main engagement is with the, with the Quran, but he's very, he's continuing a tradition, he's nothing novel, you know, under the sun. Well, there are things novel in the sense that he's applying them to modern age and furthering certain in insights. Um, definitely there, but it isn't something that's out of the blue in any way. Um, so it's it's very much, in a sense, um, classical, and 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 I don't mean to say it's old stuff, but very classical and very rooted um, in the Quran and and the, in the prophetic way and so on. And I'm going to let Sally comment on this too. I mean, because Sally is very aware that. Muslims have a bad image in some ways, and we were talking about that earlier on today. Um, but I mean, so you're clear, it, this is a branch of Sunni Islam. I mean, and it's not in that sense um, anything different, albeit with some sympathies with both Sufism and, and even uh, a positive relationship with Shia. Mm -hmm. But yes, would you like to expand? Um, yes, um, I think um, yeah, it will be fair to say, yes, Nuri, the Nursi is. Uh, consistent within uh, the general Islamic tradition. 
but what's interesting, um, for a while, there has been a resistance uh, or his work has not been appealing, you know, especially in the West, uh, in, the, in, in many parts of the Muslim world. Uh, I mean, now it is, uh, it is changing. And one of the, the reasons is because um, when you generally look at the discourse on Islamic study, in Islamic studies, what is appealing is uh, the literature about uh, political Islam. And of course, Nursi does not go into this direction. He, again, as mentioned by uh, several panels, panelists, uh, he's interested, interested in human condition, how we can survive in this uh, secular and modern environment as a believer and have God, put God in the center of our life. So this is um, uh, one thing. And the other thing is, again, um, Nursi really, he's doing something different, even though he's well-grounded in the in the tradition, but also different. You know, he it is so difficult to again. And Isra put it uh, well to put him into a frame. Uh, you know, you you cannot call him. It, you cannot call him. He's a Sufi, but he has some Sufi elements, uh, and you cannot call him uh, an Islamist. But um, so it is the different flavors together. So I don't know if it's happening. So Very see, nice. I even I couldn't put him in a frame. So. Uh, okay, hang on. Can Colin address the same question? He also mentioned that it's yes. authentic, so, the message is authentic. So how is it authentic? Yeah. Okay, you've got to talk into mics if you're going to say anything. So please feel free to say something. It's nice to see you here, incidentally. Hang on, now you've got to speak into a mic and just explain. So. I can call and address the same question because he was mentioning that uh, he find authentic interpretation uh, approach of Islam in Risale Nur. So how is it authentic comparing to political Islam or any other approach to Islam? Okay, would you like to develop your distinction between pseudo-Islam and authentic Islam? Um, and we were talking today in our, um, in our sort of uh, round table. Um, the question was asked, why are there no pastoral theologians? Why are there, are there no pastoral theologians in, in the Muslim tradition? And I said, because we don't have any theologians. So if you don't have any theologians, you're not going to have any pastoral theologians. Um, and I know some of my colleagues disagree uh, with me on this. Um, <laughs> Isra gave it away with her facial expressions yes. for those who um, missed it. <laughs> I think that Nursi is authentic in the mainstream traditions of Sunni Islam. If we go back to the 10th, 11th, 12th century, which of course I suppose supposedly the golden age of the development of Muslim philosophy, of theology, of law, of tafsir, exegesis. And um, it's, in a sense, he's, he's reviving that classical tradition, which was um, after the, the fall of Baghdad in 1258 and the so-called closing of the door of Ijtihad. And Ijtihad, for those of you who don't know, is um, independent juristic reasoning to deduce new matters of law. There seemed to be a kind of stagnation, basically, particularly in the Sunni world, where theology was frowned upon, philosophy was frowned upon as being too rationalistic, and philosophy and theology really underwent a very, very quiet period from the 12th, 13th century onwards in the Sunni world. In the Shiite world, it's a different dynamic, and things develop differently there. But in the Sunni world, and of course the Sunni world accounts for 80% of Muslims, there is a kind of hiatus of several centuries from that classical tradition of people like Ghazali, uh, people like Ibn Arabi. We suddenly have Nursi reviving that. And that is why, for many Muslims, he's, he's something really quite strange, really quite different. Because in the past 50, 60, 70 years, the lead narrative has been the narrative of political Islam of an Islam that has been politically ideologized. And for those um, advocates of political Islam, Islam seems only to be viable if there is an Islamic state or if there is a caliphate. Muslims can only be Muslims if the Sharia is being implemented. And for Nursi, these things are not an issue. He doesn't, as I said before, he doesn't talk about them. So that is why. I think that he is harking back to the authenticity of the classical uh, philosophers, the classical theologians, the classical jurists. And so, you know, this hiatus, we suddenly get Nursi after 500 years of intellectual stagnation. And again, people will disagree with me. Um, 
But compared, <laughs> <laughs> compared to the, the heyday, the halcyon days of the Abbasid Empire, um, when um, theology, Sufism, jurisprudence, all of these things were developing in a very, very vibrant intellectual society, there was a hiatus, there was a lull. And Nursi seems to be going back in the modern frame, in the modern vernacular, going back to the authentic um, spirit of Islam as it was expressed in the early scholarly communities. You know, it's very interesting. Um, so thank you for that. I'm half tempted to give Israel a chance to... to well, OK, very briefly, because it's becoming one question generating four responses, which is great, of course. Uh, so Israel, would you... Yeah, just briefly, um, I did uh, you know, have facial expressions. So I don't need to repeat them uh, <laughs> <laughs> verbally. What I want to add is that there's, um, there's more than one billion Muslims in the world, at least name tag Muslims, I mean. And um, overwhelming uh, numbers are just uh, wanting, wanting to be regular people. They go to work, they want to get a better job, have a bigger house, you know, get a car if possible, um, have a nice wedding, uh, and then, you know, be grateful to God in the middle. You know, some of them are go to mosque once a week, some of them go once a year, uh, and then some of them are more practicing. So there's this, this huge, um, population out there. And then there, among them, uh, there are people who are genuinely interested in religion. And there are, um, and we're extremely generalizing, but the one general tendency is to talk about political Islam. And that's partially because um, there has been a big shift in 19th century and 20th century, early 20th century, with this uh, colonialism, European colonialism. And after, in the aftermath of that, people had to come to terms with the fact that um, they are not in this golden age where Muslims had more power and, and so on. And, and initial response, and still some of the responses, we need to go back to that. We need to have an Islamic state. We need to have our you know, power back and so on. And then to imagine um, being a Muslim in a different way, not necessarily negating that, that you know, belief should inform our lives in society and politics. Uh, but to, to think of religion in a different way in the modern age has been a challenge. I agree with that for, for many people. And then for many people also, religion is uh, being reduced to or, you know, orthopraxy that if you do the right thing and uh, prayer means... I had one Muslim student, she said, um, she was reading um, Michael Sell's book about uh, prayer, he is a Christian, and he said when Muslims put their head on the ground, they are... Um, um, expressing humility uh, and um, you know, before God and surrender. And she wrote, one of my students, Muslim students, she said, I never thought of that. I thought in the prayer you focus on the rules, how to you know, bow and how to recite properly. She never thought that that's an expression of something about God. And so I don't want us to think that everybody is like this, but there has been this um, externalism set in, it's there. It's there, uh, unfortunately, and that's one of the challenges. Okay, now we've got uh, Rich in the front, we've got that lady there. I want you to get a microphone. Let's start with, sorry, I can't see your name badge from here, but if you can get a microphone there. While the microphone's getting there, I'm going to take a, a question from Twitter. Twitter's great fun, incidentally. So when we had the question about what common message of Norsi for Muslims and Christians today, we had an excellent answer for Zainab, which was all about the importance of your view of humanity, which can be shared and should be shared. Uh, somebody counseled in Twitter and said, it's important for Muslims and Christians to unite against poverty, ignorance, and separation. So there, yeah. Zainab. Uh, you would want to say yes as well, presumably. Yeah, actually, that came later in my mind. Because yeah, I'm sorry. You've always got to put a mic in front of Just, you, otherwise. Yeah, very quick. Uh, thank you. Excellent. Um, the, the Twitter watcher, or whoever <laughs> said that. <laughs> thank you. Because actually, I was thinking uh, Nursi has addressed Christians and Muslims together directly and specifically, of course, in many of his writings. And one of the things which you've uh, seen in the flyer is that he specifically said for this time it's important to avoid theological competition, uh, to unite against the threat of aggressive atheism, aggressive materialism. Um, is the Twitter um, person now happy? <laughs> so <laughs> I'm just reiterating what's been said. So um, that really, that's an important message because we spend so much time focusing on uh, you know, we are different. That's important, of course, and cannot be compromised and shouldn't be compromised, the integrity of our faith traditions. 
But at the same time, there is a bigger threat right now, and that we need to prioritize that first rather than saying, uh, okay, we have different theological concepts about God. We believe in one God. We maybe have uh, different conceptions uh, in that regard, but that does not take away from the greater responsibility as believers that many people face uh, a sp you know, the, the, the threat of, the lack of uh, spiritual spirituality. And I see that every day. Uh, that's not something, uh, and so to, to focus on theological differences, on theological uh, competition is wrong for this time. We need to, we need to focus on the context uh, because there's a common challenge in front of us, which is, as I said, you know, the, the threat of moral and spiritual decline. So he said that too, the Christians and Muslims that it's important to unite. Uh, Muslims should unite with the pious Christians and, uh, you know, challenge that threat. Yeah. Okay, there's another question on Twitter, which is, was Norsi ahead of his time? So I'm going to give Colin notice of that question, but we're going to take your question first, please. Okay, I'm uh, Reverend Beth Braxton. I'm Presbyterian. I hope that's okay. Here. That's excellent. We're <laughs> delighted you're here. I did get my D-min here, so. That's good. Um, I have uh, some Turkish friends who are very uh, involved in the Gulen movement. And I was wanting to know what is the relationship of, you've referred to the Nursi movement uh, in Islam. OK, they're all looking at each other saying, please give the question to him or her. <laughs> so I think I'm going to invite Saleh to answer that question. I can't uh, switch difficult questions. No, no, okay. no, no, you stay with difficult questions. Okay. So the question about uh, the question is uh, uh, moment, right? yeah. has some friends in the Gulen community. What's the relationship between uh, the Noor community and the Gulen? I community? mean, um, so historically, uh, the Gulen movement emerged uh, from the the Noor community, it, and then later on um, deviated uh, from the the Noor community, and they went. Uh, a different direction, and now, as far as I know, the the major leadings of the Nur community, um, they don't want to associate themselves uh, with the Gulen uh, movement, uh, and because of the fact that uh, they believe that uh, uh, the the Nursi, the the principles that Nursi outlines uh, are different from the the principles that they go for. I hope that helps. I. So there is a sort of sibling relationship in its roots, but the two movements have diverged. Um, on the whole, at lots of levels, there are cordial relationships between the movement. But of course, it is especially sensitive just at the minute yeah. with and the I, situation I, in Turkey. Think, Please comment. Yeah, and I think um, deviation is a kind of a little harsh word. Um, I mean, there are many, um, I guess, um, it's, it's, it, is some, it is a movement from Turkey, and um, it does have. Uh, Elements from the uh, the Risale in Ur, and people have different opinions on it. But just a general thing is, you, not everyone from that group uh, uh, is um, that extensively engaged in Risale. But there are many who are, and then there are many people who study the Risale but not part of that group. That that should serve as a general thing. I mean, it's, a, it's a complex Venn diagram. <laughs> Okay, well, let's, take, let's take it's the, a very heavy uh, we'll, we'll, we'll move the mic from strong. here down to here, yeah. and just to see if there are any other hands that I need to catch so we can get a mic to you. Meanwhile, we've got a Twitter question, uh, and that was, was Norsi ahead of his time? And Colin, you very kindly agreed to take this one. Did I? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think he was ahead of his time. He was right for the time. And I don't think that time has ended yet. So I'm not sure what ahead of his time means. Would anybody else like to comment on this one? Okay. Yes, Sally, please. I mean, um, just uh, one example. Um, uh, you know, this uh, last year, uh, Pope Francis, he wrote a personal letter to Muslims to celebrate the Eid, you know, the, the Muslim holiday. Uh, and, you know, it went uh, viral all over the Internet. You know, I, I'm sure some of you read it. Uh, it, it was meaningful. Uh, powerful, and actually the outline of his letter was that Muslims and Christians, they should have respect for each other and they should seek for understanding. 
And so, you know, when you look at the Nursi's writing, uh, I mean, I was surprised. I mean, it was all over the, uh, you know, major news uh, pages. In early 1950s, actually, Nursi, you know, what uh, just Zainab mentioned, Nursi encouraged his followers to not just, you know, in the, in the letter, he actually he emphasizes respect and understanding. But Nursi actually goes beyond that in early 1950s and encourages uh, Christians as Muslims to cooperate in order to, to deal with the common challenges. So in this sense, um, I am confident to say that he was ahead of his time. Just one example. I think that's a good answer. And the only thing I would add is I do think he was remarkably aware of the sheer depth of secular reductionist science and atheism in ways that you wouldn't have necessarily spotted at the early part of the 20th century. But he really had a full sense of the extent and depth of the challenge, and in that sense anticipates trends that we're now facing in America. Uh, Dr. Jones, please. I can map my life in Soren Kierkegaard's stages of moving from aesthetic man to moral man to that man of faith who takes the leap. But I could leap only because there was the church to leap into the safety net of God meant, or, or the abyss of God meant, to be part of the church, to be part of a community in this world and the world to come, and to understand that making this world resemble the place where God's will is done was our task. So to denigrate social organizations or to doubt that the shape of economic institutions is important seems to me to be uh, stepping backwards from a kind of engagement that belongs with the people who belong to God. So your concern is the theme about, the, about the apolitical nature of yes. Said Norsi. Yes. Is it really wise to be so detached from political institutions? Yes. Now I'm going to let Farah start with that one, and Israel would like to come in. I couldn't get the question very well. So the question Sorry. is, um, surely uh, we need to have an interest in political structures and organizations mm -hmm. in society. And economic institutions. And economic institutions. Mm -hmm. Uh, as people of faith, because mm -hmm. they're so key to our organizations. And I anyway, see. we're not all individuals mm -hmm. uh, which have uh, no connections with each other. And therefore, to stress so much that Saeed Norsi is apolitical, mm -hmm. not interested in politics, surely that's irresponsible. Yeah. Very good question. <laughs> I guess that's right. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, Dr. Jones. People knows how to make money, okay? <laughs> and in a hunky-punky way. So th they don't need teachers, okay? They need teacher only to act according to the direction of God. Yeah. In that respect, they need teachers, okay? They need advisors. They need someone to help them. They need a warner, especially at the time of, you know, I mean, what we are living in this century, people are very much clever, you see. If you, you know, if you, if you just, you know, lend your jacket to him, you, will make, you won't be able to get it back. So they are very clever in deceiving, in, you know, in stealing, in doing conspiracies, many things. So they don't need help of any advisor to make money, to... to to build buildings, construct, you know, technological things. But they need advice not to deceive other people, okay? Not to steal their, their, their you know, properties or their rights. This is first. And secondly, the most problem that 
Today, Muslims and Christians, no matter, humanity is suffering, is unawareness of themselves, okay? Unawareness of God, unawareness of the world that we are living in. We just, you know, look after luxury lives, and we just look, you know, to, to make a lot of money, more than that we need, okay? Because each of us, you see, consider myself, you see, if I die away, I will leave um, a lot of things to my children, more than what I receive from my father, okay? All of us like that. I mean, you consider yourself. But I have to ask myself, you know, be frank, did I collect all these things in a righteous way or not? I need someone to help me in that respect. This is my answer, I think. Thank you very much. And Isra, do you want to add something? Yeah. Um, just two quick things. When um, Stanley Howard was, um, when he's discussing this debate over pro-life, pro-choice uh, years ago in an essay he, that I remember, he had said, it's not about just the, talking about these two alternatives, but it's about, um, let's say, you, it's about creating a community where a child um, can can be welcomed if the parents are not able to take care of that child. As long as you don't create that community, you can be pro-life all along or, or argue forever. But if the basics is not there, it's not going to be sustainable. So I, I think in one way, Nursi's attitude is that, that if, if people don't transform from grassroots up, uh, the solutions, what he means by political is that it's not going to be enduring. If some people get together and say, this is the ethical way to go, and let's make sure everybody does this, how far can you do it if the majority doesn't feel that way? And, and many of the uh, Muslim educators in the modern age say, well, this is the right thing to do, and let's make sure you know, everybody does it. Uh, and that's not how it, sh it should be. So that's one level that he's insisting on personal engagement, spiritual transformation, not just, this, not just exclusively to be individualistic, but only that's the only secure way to have um, a, you know, a good society to have a good economic system, to have a good political system. It starts in there, and that's the most neglected one. It's easier to have banners and to go out and you know, dem make demonstrations and so on. It's harder to work on this extremely important level. So he insisted on that, even though the other one is more, you know, more excited, more fun, more active, it looks like. Um, that's that's one, one, one thing. And, um, and I forgot the second one. <laughs> But Zainab wanted to come in, if you're quick, Zainab. I try to be quick. So it seems to me, I mean, if you look into Islamic history, you have scholars who, um, uh, like Imam Hanbal, who refrained from being in uh, positions of which are aligned with pol political authority because they felt that takes away from their sincerity or people would maybe take religion not so much seriously. So they, we have in Islamic history um, uh, examples of where scholars take the role of advisorship. So there's not a world denying or escapist attitude. But at the same time, they are fully aware that the society needs also some guidance and that uh, it should be also divinely guided. But at the same time, it shouldn't be in a formal leadership position where you feel, uh, where people think, oh, this is basically, uh, you know, that person put himself into a position to promote his own ideas. And that's been also the case. I mean, we had also scholars who were in very much, uh, you know, more in, in these kind of positions. But it seems to me that Nursi is more in, uh, on that side of, at least that's my own personal reading, and everyone can uh, disagree, uh, that he's taking more of the role of uh, really the groundwork in, in, in forming and, and the psycho-spiritual transformation, but at the same time very much seeing that it comes from the ground and taking advisor roles in that sense, uh, advising maybe what uh, the, the right direction should be taken uh, in, a, in a certain case. Um, so it's not an escapist attitude. It's not world-denying. It's very much aware that a society needs to be uh, should be divinely guided, but at the same time, it's not putting itself into that formal position of leadership where people might suspect some kind of uh, lack of sincerity of, of that faith uh, uh, advocacy. 
I mean, this is such a tempting topic. We could have a whole panel on it on its own, really. Uh, and so I'll add just one comment in abuse of power while the mic moves to somebody else in the room. Uh, yes, please, sir. Um, and my comment would simply be this. You've got to remember in the Islamic world, if you want people who advocate for Islam and the state, they are there in spades. So in terms of the context, there are some Muslims who, I mean, I've got to be careful what I say here because I'm a Christian, but there are some Muslims who primarily see Islam as creating an Islamic state. So you, what you actually have partly in Saeed Norsi is a witness that, hang on, is that really what the whole Quran's about? And that's what you, you, we, you know, so in other words, you hear it as a Christian theologian thinking of conservative evangelicals who refuse to have anything to do with politics. But in the Islamic situation, the situation's opposite. You've got large number of Islamic movements committed to an Islamic state. Here you have a witness saying, hang on, look at the Quran in its totality. The state makes 10%, 20% of the text. Let's focus on the other 90. OK, yes, please, sir. I come to this from a background of 15 years teaching a program in the Episcopal Church called Education for Ministry. And about three years ago, we started a group called the Children of Abraham in my community. And I started that with a couple of friends. And we work with like 12 adults. This is our third year of this. And first of all, I just want to thank you all for just an amazing conversation tonight. But the challenge that seems to come up every year in our group is knowing that the world is uh, the problem you're facing is obviously the problem we're facing, and God is becoming increasingly marginalized. And, uh, you know, it's just, it's frighteningly, it's, it's scary. But the question, I guess, is for you, where is the hope um, knowing that? And how, is there anything that you all have practiced in, a, in concrete ways that, um, to help um, realize the vision of, of uh, Nursi in, in a ways that, you know, we kind of eat the elephant one bite at a time. Well, how are you actively attempting to bring his vision to reality? Uh, uh, thoughts uh, for us? Faris, please. Now, uh, I mean, let us talk about practices, what is going on. And under the leadership of our foundation, we have organized 10 big international symposiums in Istanbul and more than 80 conferences outside Turkey. For example, around 20 in Indonesia, 20 different, with 20 different universities, several in India, again, several in Muslim countries. And all, in all these countries, initially they resisted, you see, uh, to the ideas and views of Nursi but nowadays, there are four different companies publishing his books in Arabic language. In Sudan, in Saudi Arabia, in Egypt, and in Turkey. And there is a big demand towards his books. And now they are inviting us, come, let us organize jointly about the Muslim-Christian dialogue, okay? We said that in Nursi's writings, there is no dialogue. There is cooperation. Nursi asks his students, and then clearly he says in his writings, O oh, Christian missionaries, O oh, risale Nur students, leave aside whatever differences you have. Unite your forces against atheistic materialism in order to save your children, your future, future generations. Now, this, this idea is being central in many Muslim countries. I think it is enough. Yeah, in Philippines, in Australia, in Malaysia, in Indonesia, in, in India, in, in Pakistan, in all Middle Eastern countries, including, you see, we are here, many thanks to Dr. Markham. And also we have been to Canada, Germany, United Kingdom, in many European countries also. His views and ideas recently been appreciated in this respect. And this is one aspect of it. The another aspect is that in his writings, he emphasizes on hope, a solution for nihilism. 
and a solution for people they, if they see injustices, social injustices in the society, either they will kill themselves or the authorities. This is happening, you see. And so in that respect, you see, with his teaching of deep faith matters, so gives a kind of calmness for, for, for his readers and followers. This is what I just wanted, you know, in short. That's lovely what you said. It's now 9.29. I'm pretty strict about finishing on time. Uh, I'm going to invite Faris in a moment just to reflect on this program. Uh, but uh, let me just say uh, that I'm enormously grateful to the panelists. Uh, we have had tweets from Malaysia, from Turkey, from the United States. Um, I suspect some of these people are up quite late. Um, Turkey's working. Uh, Turkey's working, yes. <laughs> Uh, so, Faris, come and join me here. And uh, this gentleman has worked so hard uh, as leader of the foundation ever since Robert Heaney was a child. And, um, and I wish him to just take a moment to reflect on his work and bring the concluding remarks. Yeah. Uh, Professor Jan Markham, thank you very much. Thank you, brothers. This is an amazing moment that we are, all of us, observing and this is being broadcasted worldwide and this is i think a remarkable uh, truth of said nursi's writing risaleenur that muslim pious muslim uh, muslims and christians are in this room they are trying to understand his writings his words and this is really you know i cannot find you know any words to express i just won't say Thank you. May God be pleased with you. Now, uh, I because because of time, isn't it? I have uh, is brought along a symbol of Turkish tulip. Tulip is the symbol of Istanbul, and this is uh, a plaque of appreciation to Dr. Robert. Yeah. And, and, and his team. Yes. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, have a photograph? <laughs> okay, and one more photograph? Yeah, do you want to? <laughs> Thank you. Thank yeah, you. I know that it is a symbolic thing, <laughs> but it symbolizes. Uh, tulip of uh, Ottoman time and Turkey. And this is to my brother, Professor Ian Markham, in the name of Virginia Theological Seminary. Thank you, my friend. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we should recognize uh, Claire at the back who did so much work. Um, thank you, Claire. Um, I know there were student assistants. We're enormously grateful to those who did the webcasting, to Kirsten Prather, to Carol, uh, and to others. Uh, an event of this nature takes considerable organization for that. We're all grateful. And we just trust this is another step on the way to better relationships between Christians and Muslims. And for that, we just trust that uh, God may ultimately be glorified. Thank you very much for coming tonight. We appreciate your presence. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>